The gunman puts his headphones in, turns up the music on his iPod, and readjusts his gas mask. He takes a deep breath, starts walking toward the theater, and slips inside through the exit door. It's the midnight showing of the new Batman movie, and fans in the auditorium are glued to their seats. Suddenly bright sparks and smoke fill the room and everyone assumes it's a prank, probably just some guy throwing firecrackers, but that's when they hear gunshots. People run and scream and some hide under their seats as a stream of bullets lights up the pitch black room. And as the shooting continues, hundreds of 911 calls are made. Hello, 911, where is your emergency? 315 and 314 for a shooting at Century Theaters. They're saying somebody's shooting in the auditorium. And there is at least one person that's been shot, but they're saying there's hundreds of people just running around. When they finally locate the suspect, he immediately surrenders and as he's being placed in handcuffs, tells police, I am the Joker. This is the true story of James Holmes, the Batman killer. James is the first born to a middle class family on December 13th, 1987. Shortly after his birth, the family moves from San Diego to a neighborhood called Oak Hills, where his father works as both a mathematician and scientist, and his mother a registered nurse. He also has a younger sister Christina, who people call Chris, and James himself is better known around the community as Jimmy. The Holmes family regularly attends a local Lutheran church, and while in school, Jimmy is seen as a likable, scrawny kid who aces all of his math tests and is pretty quick-witted. He's pretty well-liked among his classmates and plays soccer and runs for the cross-country team. He's that kid who's always picked for anything that has to do with sports because everyone knows that Jimmy is a fast runner. Further, the kid never has any discipline issues at school or at home. However, despite his seemingly normal upbringing, there are a few warning signs that something isn't quite right with James. He struggles with mental health from a young age and tries to take his own life when he's just 11 years old. At around this time, he starts having strange experiences. He's mortified by what he calls nail ghosts, which are spirits who, in his head, are hammering on his walls at night. The Holmes family eventually moves back to San Diego, where James attends Westview High School. It's there that he becomes far more shy and introverted, so much so that his mother literally goes door to door trying to find kids from other families that he can be friends with. But instead of actually making friends, James escapes into the world of video games, becoming so good in fact that at one point in time he's ranked top 5 in the world at a game called Warcraft 3. Still though, when he's not playing games, he continues to work hard in school, graduating with honors in 2006. Throughout this time, James is able to keep his dark thoughts and desires hidden from those around him, but he is unsure how long this will last. After high school, he attends the University of California Riverside and earns a degree in neuroscience in 2010. And according to recommendation letters that have been received by the University of Illinois, he's in the top 1% of his class with a near perfect GPA. Side note, the people who review applications for grad school later say that James's stood out in particular because he submitted a photo of himself with a llama, which is a bit off. After receiving a few different offers for graduate schools, he decides to enroll in a PhD program in Aurora, Colorado. But he will never actually earn his doctorate. Instead, he'll achieve notoriety as one of the country's worst mass shooters in history. But more on that in a bit. It's here at the University of Colorado where James meets his girlfriend at orientation. He asks her out on a date and the two quickly hit it off, but immediately his behavior becomes erratic. Almost alarming. A few months pass by and they exchange the following email sequence. I'm debating whether to sleep, Skyrim, or read. Skyrim. Smiley face. Slay those damn dragons. I wouldn't know, but it probably won't be very useful for the future. How much is reading or sleeping going to help? More than video games, I suppose. The future for once. Do what you feel like doing. It's a Sunday afternoon. 
well, what I feel like doing is evil, so can't do that. What is so evil that you want to do? Kill people, of course. Killing people is too much effort. You'll end up locked up. Most people are not worth what might happen to you because of the act. That's why you kill many people. Similarly, one of his buddies recounts receiving a strange text message from James in which he asked him if he knew about dysphoric mania. This condition is where you suffer from depression and mania at the same time. Now, at this point, James has been dealing with these issues for a while and realizes that he needs some serious help. In March 2012, James starts seeing a therapist on campus, and their conversations mostly consist of suicide and James's fascination with death. In their counseling sessions, he expresses a desire to be neutralized and says he feels like he's going to explode. Regardless of these concerning words, the therapist doesn't report him to the authorities and never sends him to the hospital for treatment. They'll later testify that while they had recognized the troubling warning signs, James didn't exactly qualify for what's called a 5150 psych hold. Essentially, it's where a person experiencing mental crisis is detained for a 72 hour period. Though after receiving a threatening email, his therapist tries to put a plan in place and revoke his campus credentials, but James, who's been failing his classes, drops out of school before anything can be done. In two months time, he will prove to the world that he had been far more dangerous than anyone could ever imagine. His mental health continues to rapidly deteriorate as he disappears into his own twisted world. July 20th, 2012. James finally leaves his apartment and drives to the nearby Century 16 movie theater. There, hundreds of people are lined up outside to see the final installment of the Batman trilogy, The Dark Knight Rises. His hair is dyed bright orange as a creepy homage to Batman's Joker. James pulls up to Century 16 around midnight. He parks his car on the rear end of the building, right next to the emergency exit of theater number 9. He gets out of the vehicle and makes his way to the front door. Now keep in mind, he doesn't stand out much. He's wearing all black and there's a knit cap covering his orange hair. However, his appearance will soon change and he'll look as though he's getting ready for battle. Since the place is packed, James isn't actually able to get a ticket for Theater 9 and settles instead for number 8, knowing well he can just sneak into the auditorium. When he gets inside, he immediately heads toward the front row and at approximately 12.05 AM, he pulls out his cell phone and acts like he's taking a call. Witnesses say that it looked as though he had taken it outside to avoid disrupting the movie. He walks out of the theater through the exit door on the right side of the screen and carefully places a tablecloth clip in the door to keep it from shutting. Earlier, he'd measured the clip to be sure he could get back in so he could complete what he calls the mission. James goes to his car, which is parked just outside the door, and reaches in the back seat to grab a bag. It's filled to the brim with tactical gear weapons, and ammunition, and he dresses in armor from head to toe. He wears a bulletproof vest, a groin protector, and a gas mask. After, he arms himself with a Smith & Wesson rifle, a Remington shotgun, a Glock 22, and two canisters of tear gas. All the weapons are preloaded, and his car windows are tinted, so no one can see his arsenal inside. James then puts in earbuds and blasts techno music full volume. On the way back to the movie theater, he calls a mental health hotline for the last time, hoping perhaps someone will stop him from the atrocities he's about to commit. As the call gets disconnected, a few people inside the theater spot a dark, bulky figure positioning himself in front of the bright screen. At 12.30 a.m., James tosses tear gas grenades and smoke fills the auditorium. Everyone assumes this is some sort of joke, but little do they realize they just have a few seconds to live. Chaos and confusion set in as terrified audience members run and scream in every direction, desperately trying to escape the hail of bullets. 
Some are hiding under the seats. Several people put their bodies in front of their loved ones, and a few manage to escape through the exit doors. As the sounds of gunfire and screams fill the air, James calmly listens to his music. He later says that at this moment, adrenaline is not pumping through his veins, and he's completely on autopilot. He's carrying out a mission. He doesn't care who he hits, as long as he racks up as many kills as possible. What's going to go through your mind? Just, uh, just to get it done. Scream. You heard a scream, yeah. Did you see anyone fall from being hit? No. Really? Um, they got down kind of behind the seats pretty fast. Police are trying to coordinate with each other to stop this madness from happening. Within two minutes, 200 officers are at the scene. They arrive to find the theater in shambles, with bodies and debris scattered throughout. The air is filled with the smell of gunpowder and blood. While the attack only lasted for a couple minutes, the results are devastating. 82 people are shot or otherwise wounded, making this the deadliest shooting in the history of Colorado. 10 people die on scene, two later in the hospital, bringing the death toll to 12. And while first responders are securing the area and getting people to evacuate, James is nowhere to be found. Officers actually pass right by the guy who's still heavily armed and wearing military style attire because they mistake him as one of their own. However, they quickly realize that this is the man they're looking for and arrest him on spot. James doesn't resist and is immediately taken to the station to talk to the cops. It's now 2.43 in the morning, just hours after the deadly rampage. Not long ago, James's demeanor was cold and callous, but he shows a shocking amount of empathy when talking to the police. There wasn't any children hurt, was it? Uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll get to that. I, 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 don't, I don't know. Okay. Uh, let, let me read this to you, then, then, we'll, then I'll answer the questions that you might have. Fair enough? See, James had intended to only kill adults, hence the reason he went to a midnight showing, but one of his victims is a six-year-old girl. And if this isn't dark enough, back at James's apartment, another sinister plot is unfolding. He'd spent the past few weeks preparing for the shooting, and part of this preparation had been booby-trapping his home on Aurora's north side. While James had been in the theater listening to techno music, it had also been blaring on his apartment speakers. Now officers are cautiously peeking in his room, realizing that he's done something evil. The living room's cluttered with multiple strings of spaghetti wiring, with the majority of these wires being attached to 30 IED, or improvised explosive devices, the size of baseballs. Police speculate that they're filled with gunpowder and have the same power as a grenade. Further, they find glass jars filled with gasoline, bullets, and even more gunpowder. It's clear at this point that James not only had intended to kill as many civilians as possible, but first responders too, as part of his diabolical plan. And it just so happens that this apartment has been methodically rigged to do just that. Hours and hours of work have gone into setting this all up, and James hopes he can create a scene of chaos and destruction. It's now a race against time to make sure that no one else is injured or killed. Police tell residents to evacuate the building as they call in bomb disposal experts to disarm all the devices. They use what's called a cherry picker to place a robot inside through the apartment window. All in all, it takes them several days to disarm everything and make the apartment safe to enter. And when investigators finally step inside James's apartment, they are appalled by the things they find. The place is filled with disturbing evidence, such as a calendar marked with the date of the attack and diagrams of the theater. And hauntingly, sitting on top of his TV, a Batman mask. Later though, they'll obtain the most morbid but important piece of evidence, a notebook. 
It had been sent to James's psychologist, Dr. Lin, several days before the shooting and had detailed his exact plans. The handwritten journal is 30 pages long, and in one particularly eerie passage he writes, No consequences, no fear. Alone, isolated, no work for distractions, no reason to seek self-actualization. Embraced with hatred, a dark night rises. In the journal, James reveals his motivations for the massacre, but clearly states it had nothing to do with his failed romantic life or career. We'll touch on why he did it in a bit, because it is a crucial part of whether or not he's sentenced to death. The trial takes place in Sentinel, Colorado on April 27, 2015. Prosecutors are seeking the death penalty. They argue the crimes had been planned out months in advance, and James's attempt to conceal his identity clearly states that he'd been well aware of the wrongfulness of his actions. This is one of the more unique parts of the case to me because it clearly resembles serial killer Ted Bundy. He'd been known as a changeling, someone who rapidly changes their appearance and never quite looks the same. And many say similar things about James, whether it's how he manipulates his demeanor, weight, and of course, his hair. Further, jurors are given copies of the death diary, and this serves as a key piece of evidence in proving that the 27-year-old had been fully aware of his actions. It contains ramblings about death and destruction, and gives James's view on the world, which basically says human life is the most valuable thing on Earth. And since he has extremely low self-worth, he creates a mental delusion that every life is worth a point. So to make his life worth more points, he seeks out a way to kill as many people as possible. He'd first thought about bombing an airport, but didn't want people to mistake it for an act of terrorism. He explicitly states that he wants his reason to be that there is no reason. The defense naturally argues that James isn't guilty by reason of mental insanity. They claim that he'd suffered from mental illness since childhood, and this led to a quote, broken brain, meaning he isn't in control of his actions. They present evidence of his mental health history and call in several experts to testify. Though two months later, on July 16th, James receives the following sentence. The jury spares him the death penalty by a single vote, and he's sentenced to 12 consecutive life sentences with an additional 3,318 years without parole. It's honestly so strange to think that James had no criminal history prior to the shooting, Yet his first act of violence is so barbaric. I'm Jack Neal, and as always, stay safe, YouTube.